Welcome back to this week's Liquidity Podcast. With me today, I have Dave McClure from Practical VC. Next, we have Jordan Stein from Crescent Partners. And of course, Jason Calacanis from the Launch Fund. I'm your moderator, David Weisberg, co-founder of 10X Capital. Today, we have three topics on the docket. Another YC company is going public. VCs are calling more LP capital. We'll end with the latest three investments from our guests. Let's dive right in. Reddit's IPO represented yet another YC company that has gone public, joining YC alumni Airbnb, Coinbase, Dropbox, Instacart, and 15 other YC companies that have gone public to date. Despite the significant success of YC and the hiring of new CEO Gary Tan, some are concerned around current batch sizes and the future of YC. Dave, you founded 500 Startups in 2010. And for a long time, you were one of YC's top competitors. What do you think of where YC sits today? I'm flattered you think I was a competitor. YC was always uh, the big gorilla and probably still is. I guess I'd say we were also investing in a lot of YC companies, even though we were competing with them. So I think for the first five years of our existence, 2010 to 2015, we probably indexed into 10% of the YC companies. And we actually had a Several big wins. We were in GitLab, PlanGrid, a uh, little bit in Stripe, and also Reddit. YC is, you know, still top of the heap. It's they're really <laughs> well established. Um, they've had, you know, several very large outcomes, and uh, probably the biggest community on the planet. I think you and YC today were both criticized at some point of a spray and pray strategy, uh, which is somewhat of a derogatory term. Uh, tell me about at 500, how did your spray and pray uh, work? And given your portfolio size, how, how were you able to execute on that strategy? I won't take credit for starting that. I think it was probably uh, SV Angel that really started that, Ron Conway, and to some extent, maybe First Round Capital and a few others. But we, at one point, we were probably doing uh, the largest number of investments per year, whether that's something to brag about or not. Uh, I mean... Hey, the name was 500 Startups. It wasn't 50 Startups. It wasn't five Startups. Well, I mean, at the time, Dave, in fairness, people thought it was crazy that a firm would ever hit 500. Here we are. I think YC is at like 4,500 or 5,000 over 20 years. So you start, yeah. you know, doing the math on that. You know, it's 250 a year on average, and uh, they're doing 450 a year. So they're doing 500 Startups essentially <laughs> every year. Uh, <laughs> So you actually nailed it, uh, you know, and I think spray and pray is a derogatory way to sort of look at the strategy of can you help, let's say, five times as many startups than a seed fund would do. And what I see in, is like a perfect ecosystem now. 20 years ago, when we were all trying to figure this out, there were no angel investors. In fact, I started this open angel forum. Dave was doing 500 startups. Naval was doing venture hacks. And of course... Paul Graham had started before all of us, maybe six or seven or eight years before us doing yeah, Y Combinator. And yeah, when you, and when you look at that, at that time, there was like a $3 million seed round or a two or $3 million Series A. There really wasn't much going on in the angel space. And now fast forward, you have AngelList, uh, which Venture Hacks merged into, and you have a ton of accelerators and even pre-accelerators. And so spray and pray is a derogatory way to say, um, I'm going to make five times as many investments for the same valuation as seed funds are. So seed funds are investing at $8 million to $10 million valuations. Generally speaking, I think we'd all agree. If you look at 500 startups, launch my accelerator or Y Combinator, uh, Techstars, you get 125k for 7%-ish is the standard deal, which means you get to do four five investments for what a seed fund does. What that means is you can take a massive amount of risk. So the hit rate is very low for accelerators, even a great one like Y Combinator. Um, but you don't you you get to get more swings at bat than a seed fund. So I, I look at it now, it's almost like a perfect ecosystem has emerged. If you really want to do a lot of work, you can run an accelerator. It takes 10 times as many people, in my estimation, to run an accelerator than a seed fund. A seed fund can simply draft off of what comes out of accelerators and place bets at $10 million, whereas you know, we're all placing bets at 1.75 or just rounding up to 2 million. We're placing bets at $2 million valuations, and then we have to do a ton of work for 15, 16 weeks with the founders. So 
it's kind of a perfect ecosystem. I see it as like a perfect conveyor belt now. It was a little sloppy and messy and confusing 20 years ago, right? Dave? Well, I'd say it's maybe perfect in Silicon Valley. I don't know about the rest of the US and certainly not the rest of the world. It's not quite as competitive, but uh, I, I would agree with you. You know, we were generally getting in, uh, we, we were sort of a hybrid because we did both an accelerator and we did a seed fund. And so our seed fund valuations were probably in the four to $5 million range at the time, um, at least in the US, maybe a little less outside. Uh, the accelerator valuations were between one to two million. I think that's still the case today. So all in blended, we were certainly below five, probably around three uh, or so. We were doing about two to 400 companies per year for those first six, seven years. I, I started uh, 500, ran the first four funds, and I think we did about 1,800 companies in seven, eight years uh, for those first four uh, four funds. I think 500s up to maybe 3,000 companies or more now. But the hit rates were generally, you know, as you were suggesting, you know, fairly low, about 65 to 70% of the portfolio would fail completely. Uh, we'd get a small win, say two to five X out of maybe 20 to 25% of portfolio. We get large, large wins that were 10 to 20 X, maybe from eight to 10%. And then we'd get unicorn, you know, IPO size outcomes, 50 to hundred X or more from maybe two to 3%. I think most people would sort of say it's in the single digit percent range, low single digits. The thing that we didn't necessarily know in the beginning, but we'd seen a few of is we would occasionally get these really, really big outliers, uh, TalkDesk, Canva, you know, to some extent, a few others, uh, Solana, that were thousand X outliers. So those would only happen maybe three to 500 companies, one out of every three to 500. Um, but they do happen. And I think if you look at the YC portfolio, they've probably had at least Five or six of those really, really large outliers. Coinbase, Airbnb would be the two that have, you well, know, because decacorns are hard, right? Yeah. That's Stripe, the we talk about unicorns, probably. but Stripe, yes. yeah. And Although then Dropbox lots. has been always a, around 10. Instacart's been sub 10. So just even getting, I think we need to really have a conversation about decacorns versus unicorns, right? Because there's a, you could hit one decacorn, Robinhood's 19 billion today. And you think about 19 billion. That's, you know, 19 single digit unicorns. Like there is a power law amongst unicorns, right? Yeah, but more than Decacorn, I think the multiple makes a difference, right? Because you might only have a 10x uh, for, for Series B VCs that get into unicorns that might not be that much. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but we were generally getting in at these one to $5 million valuations. I think probably YC is getting most of their ownership at a sub, you know, one to $2 million valuation because I, I don't think. Mm -hmm. They actually pay, <laughs> they get a portion of that equity at a much lower price than maybe the rest of the LP buddy that they come in at. But it's, you know, it's a lot easier to get 100x multiple. You can't invest in that fund. You can't invest in the accelerator. Right. Well, I think yeah. They internally own a piece of that, but not the LPs. But I'm just saying it's much easier to get, you know, a 50 to 100x outcome if your average entry price is a $2 million valuation than say a $20 million valuation, which you might see some seed rounds these days. Yeah. Jordan, how many? How, how do you look at the accelerator space, pre-seed, just generally speaking? Because it is a different beast than five GPs investing in, you know, thirty or forty logos per Very fund. much. It's really hard to do successfully and to do really well. Y Combinator, I mean, Dave, to your point, really stands at the top there and, and kind of better than the rest. And they have developed this incredible community over the last twenty years. And I think, just like any other ecosystem right? It ends up sort of being worth the square of the number of users. And so I think that actually generates significant value that's hard for other people to catch. And so, you know, for us, we have a mix in terms of our portfolio being kind of established brand names as well as emerging managers. And I absolutely would include Y Combinator as like one of the best brand names in the world. A lot of people can recreate pieces of what they do in terms of providing capital, in terms of mentorship, product market fit workshops, uh, you know, all the time that they spend with their portfolio companies, but to recreate the power of that network and the signal value too, right? In terms of if you are a YC backed company, that means something. Uh, and it still does. And a lot of GPs look at that for signal. A lot of people attend demo day and do all of those different things. And so from our perspective, I don't think we would compare other accelerators to YC. I think we, YC just stands alone. Um, but if there is another group out there that perhaps is, some other advantage, I mean, it could be a vertical advantage, right? There's some interesting kind of 
AI accelerators or consumer accelerators or people who, you know, in their own way, open the same types of doors that YC does, that could also be really, really interesting. But I don't know that anyone's ever going to catch YC just given the massive lead that they've established for themselves. Jordan, how do you play an ecosystem like YC? Do you do an index style approach or do you look for funds that are stock pickers? It's a good question. And I don't know that there is necessarily a right answer to that. I think both strategies can work. And I also think it depends on your broader portfolio construction, right? So, you know, the way that we put a fund together is when we are evaluating a manager, not only do we want to understand, hey, is this strategy going to work? And I think, frankly, if you were to create an index on everything that YC has done, you would be very, very happy with the results. And you'd be happy with 20% of those results versus if you were actually able to repeatedly find alpha within that YC portfolio, that could also produce really high quality results. I think part of our decision making also depends, well, what else are we putting in this portfolio? How much overlap is there going to be between strategy X and strategy Y and strategy Z? Because there does become a significant amount of club deals and things like that that happen. And so something we need to look out for. That said, we've looked at really compelling strategies where people have put 70% of, of their fund investments into YC companies. And I think one of the differentiators I've noticed is some of those people actually bring YC companies, right? And so that to me identifies a little bit more from that LP, from, or from that GP, from that individual, their ability to kind of do this more consistently. It's not just, hey, we're you know absorbing the value and sort of a derivative approach to YC. We're actually also as good at finding those types of opportunities ourselves. And so you know, that's probably a little bit more interesting to us. If I want to just sort of create an index around Y Combinator, it'd be better to find a way to sort of invest in Y Combinator, which though you can't access the early stage, the, the batch fund in a vacuum, you know, there are ways to sort of play into that ecosystem. One thing about YC is it's great, but you also have to be aware of what the entry point of valuation is. I think these days, if you're if you're investing at YC demo day prices, you're probably investing at 16 to $20 million, you know, seed round valuations. And and possibly the best of the companies have already been funded. <laughs> so actually, yeah, that's the dirty little secret, negatively. isn't it? That they will deny, but we all know is not true. And well, they'll, they'll be sharp might... elbowed if you bring it up. And I think it's uh, funny too. You know, you, you look at a group's portfolio, and they'll say, "Oh, yeah, we're." They'll have front and center on their website. Oh, we're investors in Stripe, as an example. And it's like, okay, well, you know, when did you get in? Oh, we got in at their hundred billion dollar, you know, round. It's like, well, then I don't care that you're an investor <laughs> in Stripe, right? And so I think to your point, like, yeah, entry point absolutely matters. Uh, we've looked at plenty of funds who are like, oh, we all, we invest in these YC companies and look how well YC's track record is. And like, well, that, is that your track record or like what's what's going on there? So I, it matters. I mean, I think if you are doing the entire index of YC companies, you're going to get a great return because there are occasionally the Coinbase's, the Stripes uh, that are in that group, Airbnb. But if you're stock picking, particularly at Demo Day, you're paying a pretty high premium to select and pick, and you may not be picking the best of the companies, either, either because they're not available or because you're not necessarily a great stock picker. Um, that was easier 10, 15 years ago. You know, we were doing 10% of their batches. You know, the batch size then was only 20 companies. It wasn't really that hard to pick two or three companies if you thought they were great. And the entry point evaluation at those times was probably only between five to 10 million. So it was a slight premium. To market, but it wasn't a three, four, five x premium, uh, which is, I think, kind of what you're playing for today. We've looked at a lot of of track records. Um, I'm pretty confident that if you just take their track record in their batches, that it is the best early stage track record probably of all time. Um, it's really, really incredible. And Jason, you nailed it, which is when you're getting in at a two million dollar valuation for all these companies, and you're hitting unicorns and decacorns and and, and then some. It's just it's non comparable. Yeah. But I think there are still companies that they're going to miss. And, you know, when we were getting started, we had to pick, you know, a, a strategy to compete against them. And it was difficult. We had already started five years later than them and Techstars. And so we went, you know, one thing was scale. We, we immediately were trying to do large scale, you know, hundreds of companies per year. Um, we were trying to do outside the US, which was at the time, you know, YC wasn't doing a lot of stuff outside the US. Uh, and we were betting on underdogs that we thought were overlooked. And at the time, I think they were indexing a lot into, you know, MIT and Stanford grads, a lot of CS majors. And 
maybe to put too fine a point on it, a lot of white guys. <laughs> and so we were trying to invest in more women, in more minorities, in more international founders. And I, and I think that worked for a while. Um, when Sam came in and took over from PG, I think he also kind of recognized the value of large, large portfolios. Uh, he started scaling the batch size. They started doing more international stuff. And they also, to their credit, started investing in more women and minorities. We had a differentiated advantage for the first four or five years, but I think Sam was pretty sharp and sort of looking at where those advantages were and trying to compete them away. There are two things I've heard from you know people who are Series A investors or seed funds. Um, one is when you go to YC, a lot of the top companies have been basically don't wind up at demo day. They skip demo day. So that would be like playing in a poker game. And I said, hey, you know, Dave, you can get aces and kings and queens, but the rest of us, we can only get jacks, tens, nines. So let's see if we can beat Dave, you know, but he gets all the aces, kings and queens. And, you know, that's fine. No competition, you know, no, no conflict, no interest. There's a cobble of folks who are on the inside who Paul Graham's liked for a long time or Andreessen Horowitz or whatever. And they sort of share the best of deals quietly and they don't go on stage. They'll deny that, but everybody knows it's true. <laughs> we know examples of it. The second thing I've heard from folks is demo day is not, that's kind of the sucker's bet on demo day because it's overpriced, you know, towards what Dave is saying compared to well, it's retail traction. It's, it's retail. retail. So th the price <laughs> is going to be 20,000, you know, let's say 20 million for a company with no traction that's got six weeks of like private data, but a great story. And I think that's one of the problems is people go to YC to maximize their valuation. Okay, that's fine, but it can go too far. And if you have too much demand from dentists, like one time I went there and it was like, literally the person sitting next to me at demo day was a son of a dentist. And I said, oh, what are you doing? He said, oh, I just want to be an angel investor. I read your book. Can we take a photo? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, you know, he, he was just in that high pressure cooker. And then they came up with this high pressure tactics. Oh, you know, the valuation's... 14 million this week it's 18 million next week then it's 24 million if you sign now and you wire and they you know kind of came up with almost over optimizing to kind of create fomo and i think that's where a lot of the bad feelings about why combinator demo day kind of rooted themselves hey it's a rigged game hey there's high pressure tactics i think that's come down a bit and i know gary you know even sam Walton before him they were not encouraging people to kind of do those things but that is the truth so what people have told me is oh yeah. it's just best to meet the companies, but then wait one year, they, you know, they'll <laughs> deploy a million or 2 million. And the valuation then has to catch up. So let's say you did get that $20 million valuation, you did raise the 2 million as David is nodding, we all know you deploy that 2 million, okay, you went from, uh, let's say $0 in revenue and a beta. Now you've got, let's say 500,000 in revenue You're making 50k a month 40k a month in reoccurring revenue 500,000 for the year. Okay. What's 10 times that? What's 30 times that? Okay, 30 times that is 15. So now you're, if you're based it on 30 times that number or 40 times that number, it's the same as the, the demo day valuation. And that second uh, extension will be the same price as the demo day. So that, that was, and I have actually seen that. A lot of folks coming out of demo day, they secure the bag, 15, 20 million, they get minimal amounts of dilution. Fantastic, great job founders. But then when they come back to market, it's basically the same valuation. So we will um weight on a lot of valuations and the truth is they only accept one percent we accept just under one percent to our program they get forty five thousand applications last they tweeted and we get twenty thousand right now so we're kind of right behind them and what i would tell you is neither of us know in the one or two percent of the top companies which ones will break out and i think dave would confirm that having done this longer than i have that is there well, any you know, was, do you feel there's any what difference between say. what you determine is the top one percent of applicants <laughs> or the top three could you that, know that's what i was going to say is i think yeah. you know a lot of times you know the hot companies supposedly are the ones that already get funded but those aren't always the hot companies five years later <laughs> and a lot of times you know people may change what those are but i i Twitter, still would airbnb say, were unfundable yeah coinbase yep, too I, coinbase was fundable. not the hot Hot company in their cohort. I, I had so a chance patience to is uh, important. invest in Airbnb when they were doing the cereal boxes, and I thought that was kind of crazy. But turns out yeah. I was stupid. <laughs> but I think you know, I would still say the top ten percent of YC companies are probably worth it. But you just don't know which ten percent those are. But still, to their credit, I mean, YC's built an incredible enterprise. It's very tough to compete with them. 
And I think you have to pick your spots if you're going to do something. You know, I, I think the new program, Neo got a little bit of, there was some punching that was going on between Neo and YC, I think maybe six months ago. Yeah, they were definitely threatened by him big time. Did you see how nasty they got? They were like, uh, we're going to no, take no this comments. guy down. He got in a lawsuit with the founder. He got really sharp elbowed unnecessarily. They're, they're all, yeah. That's the other thing is they're a bit sensitive, I think. Like anytime any critique happens, they everybody yeah. like they make it into a whole like we're the underdogs and it's like you're not the underdogs yeah. you're yc it's kind of the opposite <laughs> you're the 800 pound gorilla you're not the underdogs but smart right. branding on their part to like attack him but i think if you're going to do an accelerator these days it's probably difficult to be a broad-based you know global accelerator uh unless you pick a category or a geography or something specialty like i i think probably antler Maybe entrepreneurs first, um, a few others, you know, 500 and maybe seed camp are trying to compete globally and they do have some advantages. I think I take the other side of it. I think it's easy to compete with them. The majority of publicly traded companies. If you pick a vertical or a geography or some specialty, I think you can compete, but I think it's harder to compete just broad based. Now, see, I disagree. I think if only 1% are getting accepted, I think the second, third, fourth, and fifth percentile is the exact same. I don't think anybody knows the difference between those five, the top 5%. Like maybe you could say, hey, this is the top 10% yeah. versus the top 20. But I think in the low single digits, they don't know. We don't know. Antler doesn't know. 500 doesn't know which one of those is top 1%, 2%, or 3%. And that's, and that's why we do large portfolios is because you don't generally know. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I think it's that people don't want to do the work. It's really hard to do an accelerator. You have to meet with thousands of companies to pick a hundred companies. And then you have to deal with, let's say there's two and a half founders per, you got 250 founders who then want your support and want your continued investment. It is exhausting. Most VCs and GPs are lazy. They want to do one meeting, two meetings a day max. When you run one of these accelerators, how many meetings were you doing at the peak a day? Because I know my team is doing 70 introductory calls per week. We're at 70 per week. Think yeah. about that. I mean, we had similar numbers. I don't know where 500 is at these days, but thousands of applicants, hundreds of screenings. And and we sort of decided on batch sizes that were around 30 to 50 companies. Um, you know, but we, we were running them four times a year in two locations. 200. I think YC is now doing north of 200. I, they came down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I thought right? it was too 25 or 250 per cohort. I think they hit three and one, maybe 300 was the peak, which would be 600 a year. That's too much. They're also what sharding those into, you know, categories and verticals. So even though there's two or 300 companies, I think there's probably, you know, X number of companies in, you know, some sector vertical, genetics, AI, life sciences, whatever. Dave and Jason, I'm curious from your perspective, uh, you know, let's say there's 40,000 people who apply to Y Combinator, obviously very, very small amount actually end up getting in. How much of the remaining group, how many of them do you think are going to choose to go to another accelerator um, or just say, you know what, it was YC or bust for me? No, no, the majority of them will go to another accelerator. We know because we are now moving our dates to the week after YC sends out their um, confirmation. So we don't really need to compete with them if 99 plus percent don't get accepted. So um, many of them will go to another program. And we've had many successful ones come through our program and become unicorns or, you know, uh, sent a million valuation companies already. So there's, there, there's plenty of opportunity for those folks to go to other programs than they would. I think there could, I, I, I think there should be more competition for YC. And I think, um, who is the guy who they attacked again? Part he made the Partovi, he doubled, Ali I think he doubled their deal. I think he offered 250 for seven percent. And once they did that, once he did that, that really upset them and they really went after him hard. So if you could get twice the economics from him, he knows a lot of people. He's got a smaller size. I would actually advise going to his program. Um, and I think a lot of founders did. I think that's why they were threatened by it because he just doubled their economics. If you double YC's economics, you would peel away a third of the companies, I think with a reasonable product. I think YC has a really strong value add for their program. And so it's not always just based on the economics and the numbers. I think they've built a brand that sort of, you know, feels like Harvard or your brand, whatever you want to pick. And so you, you know, you can compete with them, but you have to be, you know, the Stanford 
alternative in your field or you have to find you know your your piece of the ecosystem that is attractive um i think jason one of your points i i would say people have been competing around dollar sizes they haven't really been competing around equity portion i think there's it's probably room for someone to compete by cutting the equity down to like two to three percent um even if they offered a smaller check even if they offered a smaller check you know i think you could probably have an interesting program if you offered the same amount of money for three percent um you know, yeah, you go the other way. Yeah. I, we actually realized that in the market. I was talking to Pioneer.app. So this is a really interesting concept. And I had the founder on this week in startups at one point, Pioneer.app. And um, they weren't um, originally offering money. And I said, you know, you have all these people doing this like virtual accelerator. Why don't you just why don't you just give them 10k for, you know, one percent or something right and see how that goes and uh they're like oh that's interesting and so then i started doing it so we offer people at foundry university their first check if they haven't raised money before 25k for 2.5 percent one million dollar valuation and we did it as an experiment and we put it on their weekly check in form dave and when we did uh 60 of people asked for the 25k check 60 percent. so i ran it like an experiment i was like lean startup hey would you like this we've done i think 80 of those checks so far uh yeah. so there is definitely like the first check-in 25k we're not incorporated yet we're just two or three co-founders you know with a business plan or a mock-up uh people will take that 25k check i've confirmed it yeah. in the market i'm glad i'm not in that business anymore it's very good it's a lot of work <laughs> i'll tell you that it's, it's exhausting i can tell you because i'm exhausted sometimes it is exhausting. I would agree. If you find good people, if you have a value proposition that's differentiated, you know, particularly these days, I would say, you know, competing on a vertical focus or a geographic focus um, makes a difference. Um, you you need to have a real, you know, place to add value, whether that's on product, on growth, on people. Um, but if you if you can really deliver on that, then I think you can be still competitive. And people who are complaining about Y Combinator or the terms they get or the price of companies coming out, just create a competitor. That's what I did. And, you know, we <laughs> we we get into deals at the same terms as them or earlier, and we have our own proprietary deal flow. So do the hard work like Dave did, like I did. There's no need to complain about them. You can just compete against them and you will succeed because 99% don't get in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and again, there's a lot of successful people, people in the country who didn't go to Harvard. By the way, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, yeah. but and again, I think just people need to recognize that you know PG did an amazing job with Jessica getting it started. Sam took over, did a great job. Michael Siebel did a great job. Um, I think Jeff, uh, sorry, forgetting, also ran it for a little while. And and Gary is you know new, but he's not really new. He was also a YC founder, and you know he was running Initialized for a bunch of years, so. They've had a great string of quarterbacks, if you will, running that program over there for you know 20 years. Moving on, Carta is reporting that capital call requests hit a high in January, not seen since Q2 2022, signaling a return of VC bullishness. Capital calls are a leading indicator in that they represent a VC firm's expectations to invest capital in the near future. Jordan, as an active LP in the market, are you seeing more capital call requests in this environment? We are seeing some. Uh, look, our sample size isn't huge. You know, in our first fund, uh, we invested in 16 managers. We just actually launched our, our next fund uh, last week. And so uh, still getting that geared up. But we are seeing a slight increase. I, you know, it's nothing crazy dramatic. I think that there's probably a few few reasons for it. You know, number one, I think there's a ton of money going into AI, as, as we all know. Uh, and so I think there's a little bit of a frenzy there and a little bit of a hype there. And, and, and that I don't think that's going to slow down in the near future. I think there's a little bit of, you know, okay, we're through a bit of the uncertainty in the market, right? Whether it's going to be a soft landing, a hard landing, you're seeing signaling of, you know, interest rates getting cut. And so from my perspective, I think investor confidence is getting higher. And that's driving some of this. I think it's probably also an element of, you know, companies that fundraised in 2021 that have held off for as long as they can and are coming back and you're going to have to make some decisions around do you re-up in those companies and, and double down or, or do you not? And so uh, I think it's real. I think all of that is uh, contributing to what's happening. Have we seen like a 2x or a 3x in capital calls? No, 
but there is a probably statistic statistically meaningful increase that we've observed i'd say over the last you know quarter Dave, uh, your fund Practical is a secondary fund uh, where you take advantage of different macroeconomic conditions, including the lack of liquidity and the lack of LP capital. How are you playing the macroeconomic conditions today? Well, I think it's pretty simple. The macro condition going on is that nobody's gotten any liquidity for the last two years. <laughs> and so people need to find an alternate path uh, to liquidity that's not you know, from IPOs or acquisitions, although we're starting to see some IPOs again. Um, you know, I think the secondary market's always been an interesting place for people to look for liquidity. It's been around for, you know, 20, 30 years in private equity. Uh, it's even been around a pretty long time in venture. Um, but what we are seeing more of now is funds looking for liquidity, not just individual company founders and investors looking for liquidity. So, you know, there's certainly a pretty active marketplace for individual company secondary uh, whether that's Forge or EquityZen, which was a 500 startups portfolio company, uh, and others. But you're, there's not a lot of places to go find uh, fund secondary positions or LP and GP positions. Um, and what we've kind of found is at least um, you know below a certain ticket size, other larger secondary players like Industry Ventures and uh, Stepstone, which acquired Greenspring, those folks are writing 30, 40, 50 million dollar checks. There's not as many people doing you know sub 10 million certainly sub five million dollar tickets at least at the fund level so what, what we kind of found and this was partially you know myself as a customer i was looking for some partial liquidity in my carry in my first two funds at 500 about four or five years ago um there just weren't very many people who were buyers um at least at, at that time and i would say still um if you're looking at you know non-institutional investors in funds um Every so often, those folks need liquidity. You're sending kids to college. You want to buy a house in Silicon Valley. Um, if you're talking about a family office, they might go through death, divorce, or retirement, uh, and there might be some restructuring in some of their, you know, venture assets. It's not really a solution that's as needed for institutional players who can be patient and long term. Um, but for you know the smaller LPs uh, and sometimes for emerging managers who are still in their first ten years. They're probably going to be looking for liquidity, particularly after going through you know the last two years. One thing I will say, you know, we uh, incorporate secondaries into our strategy uh, in terms of our our fund, and 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 one of the things that we've noticed in terms of why we believe there is a little bit of a, a sort of lack of participation, or there has been historically, is it's often really hard to get information. And from my perspective, you know, if you're a part of that ecosystem and if you know part of that fabric, then you can get behind the door. Uh, if you're underwriting, you know, a portfolio or a single asset, if you don't have a relationship with the GP who is the investor in it, and you're trying to, you know, buy a piece from someone else, uh, sometimes that GP will say, "Well, I don't, I don't, you know, if you want to do the transaction, sure, but I'm not going to spend time to help you understand where this company is or isn't." And so, you know, we've kind of put that as a a a filter from our perspective of like, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna engage unless we're already, you know, have a relationship with the manager. And so I think to be successful, you really have to have those relationships. And a lot of those smaller dollars that you're referencing, talking about, like there's no way for them, unless they're otherwise involved in the VC ecosystem, to really get behind that that curtain and that wall and understand it. So I think that also impacts the decision making a lot more than it would in other asset classes. Yeah, and I think even within secondary, there's a big difference between what's called direct or company secondary and the strip sales, which are really portfolio secondary. You know, there's a lot of people who, you know, both professional and, you know, I would say the tourist investors who are looking at individual company secondary and because these marketplaces have, uh, you know, interesting names on them, people, there's, there's lots of people who want to get into, let's say, you know, Stripe or SpaceX or Canva or something like that. That's very well known. Um, but again, like you said, you're not really even going to know about portfolio secondary deals unless you're part of the ecosystem and have relationships there. Um, you're going to need consent from the general partner of the fund you're buying into if you want to do that. So you have to be an acceptable investor to them. Uh, you're evaluating a basket of assets, not a single asset. And so you have to underwrite multiple uh, companies. And then you also have to think about like what's the exit trajectory for those vehicles. Um, so it's it's a lot more complicated to do portfolio secondary than individual company secondary. But that said, for folks who are willing to go after it, because there's so few people doing it, 
uh, you can get some really good pricing and arbitrage on that as a buyer. Jason, you're in 24 funds yourself. Are you seeing more bullishness with these capital calls? No, it's pretty consistent, I have to say. Um, it was a little bit slow last year, um, I think. I, I saw some funds weren't drawing down, but I think it's pretty consistent. And I, you know, it's not enough that I would notice it when I make a commitment. It's typically somewhere from 25K for these five to $10 million funds, 50, you know, K, 1% of the fund, all the way up to 500K maybe when I do these for my family office. And yeah, I kind of have that money set aside. So I don't really even notice this, this, you know, minor spike. I do think what it shows more than anything is that uh, VCs, the general partners at these firms have dealt with a lot of the um, uh, triage that was going on in their portfolio. So just anecdotally, speaking to other VCs on a regular basis, being on the board of some companies, you know, there were a lot of companies that needed to do uh, a big riff, like two thirds of the company. And instead of doing a two thirds riff, like Elon did at Twitter, they did a 10% riff, a 20% riff, and then a 30% riff, and then a 10% performance riff. And, you know, this occurred over 18 months of finally, you know, working with the founders to accept the reality that they didn't need 400 people for a $10 million ARR company. They needed more like 75 people or 100 people max, right? And so, you know, they, there was a lot of that going on, which I think was a distraction from putting money into new companies. And I think Jordan, you said like, there was just like some overhang, right? Of And I assume you were talking about valuations and like re getting reset and coming back to reality. So I feel like nine out of 10 of my four out of five or nine out of 10 of my, you know, challenged companies, the challenge has been resolved either by shutdown and aqua hire or a right sizing of the company. Do you think we're done with that? Because I'm not sure we're done with it. I think that, you know, the active management of turning the corner has probably been done by many companies, but the ultimate shutdown decisions, I think that's, we're still going to see a lot of that. I, I was talking to Absolutely. a friend over at SVB and, you know, two, three years ago, uh, there was an article last year that was written by Elad Gill about when these companies were going to run out of money. And, you know, he was sort of, but he was talking about how a lot of those companies had raised so much cash in 2020 and 21, even though, you know, burn was high. Those companies had three, four, maybe even five years of runway. Uh, once the downturn hit, everybody started trying to reduce their burn and they extended even further. And so, you know, I, I spoke to someone at SVB a few months ago. They said, finally, uh, the average company was down below 18 months of cash. Um, and so my guess is we're still going to see a lot of blood in the water this year and possibly into 25 where people have to make decisions now. Like when you have three years of cash, even if you're trying to cut, like you said, you're, you're not feeling like, oh, I have to figure this out tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so this isn't, that this isn't, by the way, an issue isolated to venture. You have this wild, wild situation in public biotech companies where some public biotech companies, their drug has failed. And they're sitting on $100 million. And basically, public shareholders have to come in and do a hostile takeover and do some kind of negotiated agreement. Get the money so back? It's, a, it's wild times. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. common thing. Well, to but, but see, the thing there is that at least for public companies, those valuations get reset based on what people know about the companies. In private markets, they're not getting reset. And so what's happening is VCs, we're, we're all, you know, we're all sinners. We're all liars. Uh, almost every VC that I know is still holding their portfolios at valuation set in 2020 and 21. The, the first thing that we we say when we talk to people about assessing value in their portfolios is, have you done any proactive markdowns after Q1 22? And if the answer is no, which is pretty much what it is for most of them, we're like, well, your portfolio is probably overvalued by at least 50%. You should be reducing or cutting by 30, 40%. Jordan, how do you look at that? You have multiple funds in the same company you see them carrying at different levels how do you how do you look at that you have a really interesting conversation with uh one of the two managers usually and you say hey uh let's talk about this because this doesn't make sense to me and one of your co-investors uh is holding it at a lower valuation and frankly given what's going on in the environment and then they usually give you some line about how their policy you know kicks in in six months and so they haven't proactively done it because they want to maintain policy, which makes them more conservative and consistent and all of that. Especially so, if they're fundraising. 
Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting point too, is honestly, the ones who are fundraising are usually the ones who wait the longest to take the, the markdown. But truthfully, it's been a really important tool in, in our toolkit, especially in this environment, to try and understand the real value of these underlying portfolios. And so, you know, one of the things we've tried to do is whenever we're speaking with a manager, you know, we're trying to understand that information and be able to reference it later. So that if we're looking at, you know, fund manager X, we're going to say, oh, wait a second, we've seen these few companies before. And in fact, they were marked at this. And so uh, I think, <laughs> like I said, sometimes it ends up being an interesting conversation, but honestly, the vast majority of the time, it's like, yeah, it's just our policy and we're being consistent. Don't you want us to be consistent? It's like, well, no, I want you to be honest and realistic, but that's how I it goes. I want you to mark to market. I want you to assess a fair market valuation. I guess this is the point that I I kind of want to make though is the reason that these companies haven't been marked down is because there's no market pricing activities that are forcing them to do so. Unless these companies get sold, go IPO, do a down round or shut down, those are not market pricing events. And even if they're funding them, they're bridging them on notes that are not really setting a price, particularly for the folks who are bridging their own companies. They don't want to price them to where they really should be because then they'd have to remark their own portfolios. And if they're fundraising, that might mean bringing a three or four or five X portfolio down to maybe only a two or a 2.5 X portfolio. The other thing I would say is we're pretty actively trying to pay attention to where secondaries are at. And that can be an indicator too, right? If something is trading actively on a secondary market, doesn't force repricing, but it does allow you to ask the question and say, well, someone's paying this for, for this asset. So yeah, and, and the fact that people are even paying anything for private market companies, like I'll get some low ball offers for some of our companies. And I'm like, Oh, well, that's great that there's a trade occurring. Um, you know, uh, at all, you know, the fact may that not, somebody may not even be a price. Yeah. 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 Because in some cases, people are like, Well, yeah, I'm not going to invest in that company. The overhang is too, too large. I, I have been getting a number of some founders have taken it very seriously getting to profitability or break even. So I've started to get the infinity sign in months of runway. We are infinitely, uh, our number of months of runway is infinity. And I'm like, well, that's charming and awesome. Great. Um, and then hope renews, and which is what's happening. And people say, oh, well, if you're growing, you're at infinite and you've got 5 million in the bank. Great. And you're making 3 million a year. Great. What's the number going to be next year? And they're like, 4 million. We're like, oh, okay. Can we have a conversation about growing faster and losing some money? So here we go again. <laughs> you know, the what? cycle growth over profitability. Oh and my then gosh. Here we go. And I and Back literally 2019. <laughs> this I think like the the second half of this year is going to be um growth and uh reasonable investment, aka losses, reasonable burn in order to hit, you know, more aggressive growth topics. Because I think everybody was just like batting down the hatches. Let's make sure that our ship doesn't crash into the rocks. Okay, the storm's over. Okay, feels like, okay, it could be choppy water, but it feels like the storm's over. Okay, we're out of the storm. Okay, now let's, have, let's, let's start a plan to grow this thing again. And I think that was hard for a lot of people. And I'll just make a note to folks, and I've experienced it in my own career. Man, uh, moderate success is as bad or more pernicious to break out success and is more of a blocker than no success. Because if you have no success, you just shut the company down. It didn't work. It's failed experiment. We all move on. You get to three, four, five million dollars in revenue. You get this like tweener company. Okay, great. We got to three million, but we can't move it up. The the revenue is not coming. Okay, great. What do we do? And you're like, well, we have a three million dollar business. Let's try this strategy to grow. Let's try this strategy to grow. And you just may have hit like the natural audience and you got to really, that's a tough one for founders is what do you do with the $3 million, $5 million, $10 million success, quote unquote, but it's not a venture success. You know? Have you seen any of those break out or they Never. all stay middling? What I don't think it ever. Dave? Yeah, they just have to get sold. They have to get sold, spun I out. A, yeah, it almost never breaks out. To describe the situation, which is oh, usually please. winners keep winning, losers keep losing, and tweeners keep tweening. And yeah very okay. hard to move a tweener to a winner. I think in a few cases, you could pick your battles and try and get some folks, you know, back onto a growth path. But I would agree with Jason if they're, if they're, you know, again, this really depends. Like from an investor perspective, something might not be a win that from an operator perspective could be a win, right? If you've got a company sure. doing 10 million in revenue, generating one to 2 million in profits with modest growth, 
that's probably not a win for an investor. That could be a great business for the operator. Um, so it really does depend yeah. on your perspective there. And that's where the difficult conversation of buying out the investors has to occur. So they can at least take the loss or, you know, wind down uh, a fund. You know, when funds get to 15 years, people just, my understanding is buy the shares, have their shares bought back for $1 from the failed investments and, or just try to sell them in a strip, maybe to Dave <laughs> or no. Do you find well, yourself? That's not where we buy. We're, we're generally buyers yeah. around the seven year mark. Um, you know, so our, our optimization is for when, you know, we look for funds that are doing well, where the losers have been written off and winners have emerged probably, you know, let's say it's somewhere between series B and D, uh, 30 to 50 million and up in revenue. Um, but there's a whole other, you know, business in secondary that's kind of like wrapping up end of life vehicles, uh, establishing continuity vehicles that probably happens between years 10 to 15. And, and generally, you know, we, we sort of bump up against that, but those other buyers are buying out the entire position of the fund or really what's happening is they're, they're finding out the LPs who want liquidity. Uh, they're figuring out which are the core assets that are still growing. And then they basically create a continuity vehicle with the high quality assets, roll in the LPs who are still patient, buy out the LPs who are not patient. And now you've got a great, you know, high quality portfolio you can run for another five years. Uh, whether that's maintained by the you know the same managers or new managers, you're basically sitting on high quality assets that are hopefully heading towards an IPO. But you can extend the life of the vehicle three to five years and manage out you know the LPs who are patient and pay off the LPs who want liquidity. Uh, I think that's going to be a really big business that's going to start happening in the next couple of years. The the other one that we are doing that I think is really you know probably on a lot of people's minds right now is buying secondary and strip sales to generate DPI. Like there's a ton of managers who are sitting on, you know, paper gains and performance. You know, maybe I don't always believe that they've got 5x there. That's probably based on that 20, 20, 21 valuation. But they might have 2.5, you know, to 3x of real value, but they have zero DPI or very small in a DPI. And so, you know, IPO activity and honestly not that much MA activity. I think you're going to see a lot of people doing deals to do strip sales to generate DPI, and those fund managers want to be able to raise their next fund. Um, so that's another area where we think we're seeing a lot more interest from managers to do secondary sales. Are we seeing funds that are shutting down, looking for custodians to wind them down? I know of like two funds I was involved in as an LP that are not continuing on. They're not doing a next fund, and I'm. You know, I, I didn't ask them explicitly, like, are you going to manage this for the next, you know, it's, it's your four of the fund, you, who's going to manage it for the next 12 or 10 yeah, or whatever it 10 is. 10 years at least, right. Yeah. So w what happens well, to all these fund managers there's, who there's are There's a lot quitting? of it depends. Uh, it depends mm -hmm. on whether, you know, the LPs are friendly or not. Depends on whether it's an audited fund or not. Uh, depends on whether they have winners in that fund mm -hmm. or not. Um, but I think that, you know, half the audience... Is probably the default case, which is a lot of people jump into venture and don't continue. <laughs> In fact, that's the majority case. Um, and and when these are larger funds, maybe there's some continuity there. They have management fees to live on. But for most smaller funds, like you, you're not you know coasting for five years on the management fees of a five to twenty million dollar fund, at least in most cases. Um, so I think those will probably bifurcate into the folks who have winners. And or the folks who are committed to a career in venture, um, but for the majority of those folks who don't have winners or are not committed to a career, yeah, those those funds are probably going to be uh, walking dead to some extent. Um, depends on what kind of you know support is required from the companies to maintain them. Um, mm. The real question is from the investor's perspective, you know, do they expect anything out of that, and are they expecting to get quarterly reports and? Who's watching the story? Have you had it happen, Jordan, to any of yours? Not yet. No, nope, we have not. I haven't had it happen. Hadn't any, haven't had anyone signal that it's going to happen. But you know, our first fund, the first investment we made from it was 2022, uh, right into a net new 2022 fund. So we've invested into 2022, 2023, some degree 2024 funds. So I really hope nobody is thinking about shutting down within their first first <laughs> or second year. That would be problematic. I, I really I enjoyed the first year. More, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. It's it's between year four to eight when people yeah. decide to check out. I mean, you're past the investment period and you're probably past when you've had, you know, sort of the front loaded 
management fees. When you're when you're done writing checks and when management fees, you know, start to ramp down typically around year five, six, seven, if you don't have winners, a lot of people check out. Yeah, it's a it's a paradoxical career because you don't know if you're good at it until you're and six or seven. Seven, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And yeah. so like how often is it like play in the yeah, you can play basketball and we'll tell you when you get to year seven <laughs> playing basketball or running marathons or being a chef like your seventh year as a chef we'll know if you're yeah. any good at it it's like hmm yeah well so it's if, an interesting if you haven't been able to raise a fund every like three to four years right you're, you're gonna check out if you haven't raised a fund in the last four or five years yeah. that makes it and that's it and that's a really interesting point too where it's like okay when we're for example going to re-underwrite a fund uh, right. And we're, let's say for this, this current fund that we, we have right now, I'd anticipate, you know, half our managers are going to be, uh, re-ups from, from fund one. And, you know, what do we have to look at? Well, the investment we made in fund one is not going to have a whole lot of performance. And to, to your points, it's not really like you can draw a whole lot of conclusions at from it. You can look at, you know, did they say, did they do what they said they were going to do? Did they improve their team? Did someone leave? Is there any drama? You can look at their older portfolios and say, okay, they seem to think this thesis was going to work. And by now we actually see more of it working or less of it working. But if it's a new fund and all you have to go on is, you know, one fund or even potentially two sometimes, that can be a little bit more difficult. What do you go off of in that case? What are some leading indicators that you look at that help you make that decision? So it can be a number of, of different things. And I think it can be case by case basis as well. Our thesis around venture is centered around the following, which is, you know, is this individual, is this fund manager, this firm going to see the best opportunities and the best founders? Uh, are they going to be able to win investments into those founders and into those companies? And I think that's a really key element. Uh, and then, you know, how do we kind of prove that those two things are true and that they're able to pick the right ones from the bunch? And so in a lot of cases, you know, from our perspective, we're never going to invest in a fund one where that person hasn't invested in a company before. And it's like a true first time venture capital investor. The three fund ones that we did in our, in our first fund were all generally spin outs from institutional firms. Uh, and so, you know, there you at least know, okay, well, here are some of the companies they invested in prior. And so you can continue to follow that story. Uh, you know, we'll do new references. We'll talk to their founders that they've invested in, you know, from prior funds as well as the fund we've invested in trying to get to the answer of, would you recommend this person to a founder friend of yours? Have they done the things they said they would get, they were going to do, right? And maintain the type of reputation where they will continue to be able to win deals and continue to be able to support entrepreneurs. It's a lot of qualitative work, I would say, and, and requires pretty significant resources to, to be able to get right. And then we'll also talk to the rest of the community, right? We'll talk to other venture firms. So we'll say, hey, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, you know, what's your perspective? You've been working with this group here on two boards with them. You know, how have they delivered over the last couple of years? How has that reputation maybe changed, not changed? And so, um, you know, talking to those GPs is equally as important. And then we'll talk to other LPs too, right? Who are generally able to do similar things that we can from those references, from their analysis, and really benefit from aggregating the information that they've generated along with ours uh, within that community to, to try and make that assessment. But you know, beyond that, it's not like you can run some model and say, yes, this checks or no, this doesn't. Yeah, I, I think, you know, my we we do a fair number of small checks um, as LPs, primary LPs into funds. And I've been doing that for probably the last 10 years or so. So we've invested small tickets into about 40 or 50 fund managers. And when we were doing this at 500, we had started about 20 small funds within 500. Um, Jordan's spot on it's very difficult to do diligence in the first three four years of a vc's career um but i think jason mentioned this on a previous podcast and it's sort of the same math that i look at which is what's the progression from pre-seed or seed to series b and and there's several rounds in between there and and you're not looking at it on a, an exclusively quantitative basis like everybody can get lucky and get one big winner here and there um, but what you're looking at is a proportional progression of the portfolio where you're getting consistently, let's say anywhere from 30 to 50% of your bets from pre-seed to seed, from seed to series A, uh, from A to B. And, and probably somewhere around series B, 
you've got a company that's actually got revenue, got product market fit and is progressing, right? And not necessarily that that's going to be a great investment, but as an early, if I'm looking at early stage managers, I want to find out what's their ability to sort of pick and or help companies from those early stages to some level of sustainable progress, which is usually, in my opinion, three funding rounds, um, but somewhere between pre-seed C to series B is that progression. And if they can get a minimum of 10 to 15% of the companies, regardless of the quantitative you know, outcome and TVPI, that's interesting. Certainly, if they're getting 20% you know, from C to B, that's a pretty good number. Yeah, that continuation strategy um, and that data was something I was introduced to going out for my fourth fund. I had never studied it uh, and really focused on it, but I did see that some of the larger LPs did look at that and we had to... Uh, you know, have them not benchmark us versus seed funds. I was like, oh, no, 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 we bring the inventory to seed funds. So at seed funds, our percentage looks really bad. But then when you compare it to um, other accelerators and pre accelerators and pre seed, it looks just fine. So each of those jumps, if you're doing your job correctly, you have a very low batting average. If you're an accelerator, because you, if you're an accelerator, you really are trying to work the power law. You really need to look for crazy ideas like Coinbase and Airbnb and Uber and Robinhood. You really need people who are, you know, trying to attack windmills. Like you need the crazy lunatic founders to bet on. And you can't just be betting on, you know, all SaaS, you know, run of the mill copycat products. You need outliers and you need to bet on crazy things. And those have just a very high attrition rate uh, at the earliest stage, right? 80, 90% going to zero when you're running an accelerator, pre-accelerator. But you're getting it at low prices. So, I mean, I think you always have to balance that. You know, there's something we used to look at, which I was calling like value-weighted progression. Um, and usually it was like, what's the round-to-round step up in value? What's the uh, follow-up? on or survival percentage and what's the dilution and if you multiply those numbers theoretically they should be better than one <laughs> in other words if you're deploying a dollar you should get better than a dollar's worth of value at the next stage but it's also interesting math to look at for whether you should be doubling down or not um so like we did that analysis at one point even though there's high attrition rate at the accelerator you know the step up in round to round valuation you know is usually like 4x, sometimes it's even more than that. So again, if you're getting in at between one to $2 million valuations, and these companies are raising at a minimum of eight to 10 million or even more, you have a really incredibly good step up in round to round value. And so if you get a, a significant percentage, let's say at least 30%, 40%, you know, you're getting a number that's, you know, far greater than one. Uh, and conversely, it usually means that that's not such a great uh, place to be making a follow on bet. <laughs> because what we would typically see is that even with the attrition, because of the low valuation, we would get our best IRR check at, at pre-seed in the accelerator program. Um, that's not always true in less competitive environments. In in other places outside the US, that step up in round to round isn't as you know significant. Um, so it might make sense to have more of a follow-on strategy in those less competitive markets. But if you're doing a good job as an accelerator manager or as a seed fund manager, you should be getting your best IR on your first check, in my opinion. Yeah, and just to build on that, it's the conversation I have with our RAAs, we call them researcher, people we hire out of school, analyst, somebody who's done 500 introductory meetings with a founder uh, over Zoom, recorded them and written coverage of them. And then a thousand you know, uh, calls, you get to associate level. So these are and people can do it in less than a year. They can get to 500 and 1,000 calls in one year each step up. So we like them progressing quickly. And with that group, you know, I will ask them to advocate. And they write their deal memos. They advocate for companies. And we have that record for all time, right? That they were saying, yes, we want to do this. And then I say, no, here's why. And then we have to live with that. But the framework I put into it when I'm asking them is, okay, we did, we already own 7% of this company for 125K, call it a $2 million valuation. Okay, now they're going out of 10. In order for us to get another 7% would be 700,000. So to Dave's point, do we need to get to 14% right now? Probably not. What if they've proven since they've graduated? Who knows? But maybe we want to get to 10% ownership. And then I asked them for that 300K, would you rather do three more? accelerator companies or two and a half or would you this like to do is so smart 
<laughs> would you like to do 12 more swings at bat at the 25k two and a half percent and inevitably they come back and they're like i would like to do another 125k bet and i would rather do seven 25k bets or i'll do two 125 bets and two 25k bets i'd rather have more shots on goal for my performance right so this Absolutely. is a very interesting super framing smart that you do yeah. that yeah like I, I so so many people have that follow-on framework they don't think about you know you have limited amount of resources you have a finite amount of bets that you want to make is the marginal amount of ownership you're going to get in this company worth it you know yeah. because you you already have a bet on the table in this company you really need to be buying 50 percent more relative ownership I would say arguably 100% more relative ownership in order for that to really make sense. Because like, if the company's going to win, you've already got whatever ownership you've got. Yeah. You know, Are you sure you want to add a marginal amount of ownership in that versus like betting on something else or betting on five other something else's? Yeah. And it really is a function of your deal flow. Maybe you don't have a better deal in your deal flow, or maybe you have too many good deals. I find myself having too many good deals wanting to come to our programs. And so I tend to lean towards that. But I did come up with a framework that has taken me about a year to come up with to train the team on what I think is a likely winner coming out of the seat stage and what I think is a definitive winner. And now that I've codified that, we have a much better framework. So we do those two frameworks. Is it a likely or a definitive winner? Or would you rather make these more smaller bets in the programs? And it's just Have changed you those everything. Deal memos I, into an AI. I would love to see like three, four years of that. <laughs> okay, great. You're already thinking about it. <laughs> I mean, that, that this deal is the memo thing that, like, that's got to be gold four years later, five well, years Well, I've also tagged the data. So we now, you know, every week, hundreds and hundreds of applications come in and 70 meetings, 70 calls, 70 call notes, you know, and the stuff. So yeah, we are, you know, like the other day, I was just like, Tell me how many marketplaces we didn't invest in. And they were like 397. I was like, email them all and ask for an update. <laughs> I love marketplaces. I've made all, I, a lot of the money I've made in this life has come from Uber, Thumbtack, a lot of marketplaces in our portfolio that have done pretty yeah. well. So I'm like, get me the marketplaces from the database. We don't have any deals. Great. Let's go back to the deals in the database and being able to pick and port my, my obsession. And I've said it before on this show. I have two things I'm super obsessed with right now. We have the deal flow. We have the decision making. We don't need to compete to get in deals because it's seed and pre-seed. There's passing the hat most times. So really, the doubling down strategy is really the thing I am most... And portfolio construction, which is the same thing, essentially. Our doubling down strategy is, is everything for us now because we know we'll have in fund for 250 names. And we just need to add... We know there's going to be some breakouts we just need to know which 10 <laughs> which five yeah. percent will break out and that's 12 13 companies out of 250 will break out <laughs> which ones are those how do we know it's a breakout company or not that's the obsession i have right now you know i think there's a great article i don't know if it's widely distributed but clint corver at ulu ventures uh wrote a uh, pretty interesting analysis on follow-on strategy i think it was probably written about five or six years ago. Um, and, you know, really somewhat, you know, contrarian. I think a lot of LPs, uh, particularly institutional LPs, look to see, you know, conviction, <laughs> which, which I think probably induces more follow-on behavior than the market should really be exhibiting. Um, you know, I, I actually think the default case should be you should not follow on <laughs> in most scenarios you're you're better off making a diversified bet on another company and it's only in the very clear cases of strong growth and significant you know marginal ownership that that follow-on bet really makes sense i mean unless you're doing it out of a separate you know pocket or separate fund i, I think from the lp perspective they have exposure to 2025 20, managers and each of those have 20 to 25 companies so they have 500 underlying companies so they feel like they're capturing the power laws, but they want that alpha. They want the next Airbnb you put in 25% of, of your capital into that. They want that high outperformance. So there, there is some rationale there. But if that follow on bet is based well, again, on. It, it might be a good no rationale info, for the LP, not for the emerging men. For the GP. <laughs> yeah. For the GP, it's similar to a VC investing into a company. It ends up being an N equals one. And if you, if you win, you win marginally, it doesn't really change your life. But if you lose, you don't do another fund. So there is a somewhat of a mismatch there. 
I think from the LP side too, it's 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 very funny. I've seen uh, people who have shown me presentations that have said, you know, if I had just leaned in more to this company, which is what we now do, look at the returns I would have made. And I have seen people say, you know, if I hadn't followed on as much, which we don't do anymore, look at the returns I would have made. Uh, you know, you can be successful doing it either way. I think some of the better returns we've seen have been from doubling down, tripling down. Uh, if you get it right, I think it works really well. And if you're able to leverage the kind of asymmetric informational advantage you may have, uh, it can work really, really well. Um, I'll tell you another concern is, you know, especially if you're investing across funds or if you're leading multiple rounds in a row, you know, are you propping this company up? Are you throwing good money after bad? And understanding that dynamic too, I think is something that's important from, from the LP side. Yeah. If I could go back, I probably made you know, 10 bets in each of the funds, first fund, second fund, third fund, maybe 20, where I wouldn't say they were sympathy bets, you know, but they were founders who really resonated with me as a founder um, and who convinced me, yeah, they were going to figure it out. And I placed the bet, but maybe that, that those bets would have been better into, you know, another new company. And, you know, that, We've now figured out a way to, to communicate that to folks that we are not the permanent source of capital uh, for our companies and that we don't invest in bridge rounds. We invest in companies once or twice and get to seven to 15% ownership. And then we deploy capital into new companies. And once we explain that to folks, they were cool with it. They, they still might ask us, but you know, I think a lot of GPs get caught up in loyalty to founders which i understand and i've been super loyal to founders and i want to give them that support but you know you have to have a portfolio strategy and now we just say hey the fund you're in is fully deployed that's it and you wouldn't pass the rigor of the new fund because it's not growing right now so we can't bridge you that fund's closed the new fund's open you'd have to have 3x growth to compete for those new fund dollars and when you do, we're happy to have that conversation. But the company sideways, you got to go find money in the market. And I think that discipline is really important. It's really important. And you only get to that level of discipline, I feel, when you get to your you know, third, fourth, fifth fund, and you have to face the scrutiny of LPs or like, tell me about these re-ups. You know, tell me, you know, somebody like Jordan, like, hey, uh, I see you did these bets. What was your thinking? And you know, I got to pull it up. And go to the deal memo, go to the Slack conversation, and okay, yeah, I made a mistake. That was a that was a poor bet. I put bad money, I put good money after bad. You know, I made a bad bet on a startup. Okay, we're all adults, but uh, then that second or third bet, that's where you really have to start questioning. You know, do you have a good portfolio strategy? I think I don't think I had a great portfolio strategy in the first couple of funds. I think I had like the standard one, which was better hunt. You know. Bet on 100 companies, hope for the best. By the way, Jason, you, you hit on something I think is interesting, which is the ability, you know, growth mindset, ability to get better and to learn and to evolve your strategy. When we talk about going back to, you know, how do we look at a fund, uh, evaluate a fund one or a fund two when they're back in market, that is a part of it, right? Um, hey, I want to hear about the bad investments you've made and what did you learn from them? I want to hear about what you would do differently in your next fund uh, and continue to see that growth. And so I think that's another element too. I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear me say that there is, you know, sometimes a little bit of ego in, in venture capital. Uh, and so, you know, to that, to that extent, you know, when I know, right, crazy. And um, when, uh, when you can see a little bit more sort of humility and growth and ownership and like, you know, I can always be better and I can always get better. I think that is also something that, that we find compelling. Now on to the lightning round of top three investments from each guest. Uh, Dave, go ahead. Uh, well, I guess, I, you know, most of the investments we do are at the fund level and private, so I can't really talk about which mm. deals we've done that are great there. Uh, I can talk about the direct uh, secondary deals we've done. Right. Uh, so I guess three of those, uh, Mercury, uh, which a lot of people probably know, is uh, startup banking and APIs uh, for companies, uh, and credit to Zach Coelius, I'm an LP in oh, Zach's fund. Uh, Zach is really amazing. Uh, I've tried to hire him at least twice <laughs> in his career, my career. 
Um, but he's running a great fund and uh, Mercury was one of his winners uh, and he uh, helped us get into uh, a private secondary in the company that was great and we'd love to own more. Uh, so that one's doing great. Uh, also great as a customer if you're a startup looking for banking yeah. services. M- and well. Mercury has supported my podcast over the years. Great company. Yeah. Uh, really uh, supportive of founders. Another one that we're an investor in is a company out of Germany and Austria, uh, Austria called Gropius. Uh, actually working with them on changing the name to greener.com. Uh, but they do factory automation and robotics for building prefab uh, multifamily housing. So condos and apartments. Mm. Uh, you can kind of think about it as like a Tesla factory for building condos. Uh, pretty amazing company. The founders have both been involved in other public tech companies. Uh, one of the founders was previously involved in Delivery Hero. The other one led engineering at Zalando. Uh, it's about 400 people. Half of them are software engineers. And they basically do programming on these robotic arms to build um, you know, prefab housing, basically walls and siding uh, very quickly. Uh, and their customer isn't the end uh, owner or renter, it's the real estate developer. And so they put together those walls and sidings, uh, deliver them to the construction site, and then the real estate developer builds those uh, houses a lot faster because they can just assemble them fairly quickly. Um, and I think this is a, this is an interesting theme that I think we'll see in a lot of physical manufacturing companies is automation and robotics, you know, sort of improving the economics and productivity of physical manufacturing. In in the same way, everybody's going gonzo about AI making software companies better and more productive. I think robotics automation is going to make a lot of physical bits companies more productive. Uh, And then last one I'll highlight, uh, we've been doing a fair number of secondaries in Latin America. Uh, For folks who aren't aware of it, you know, Brazil and Mexico are really, you know, big drivers for the Latin American market, but it's a pretty large overall market that's larger than California GDP and half the size of China GDP. Uh, Mm. A company we invested there is called Ricarga Pay. uh, That's out of Brazil. And basically, uh, I don't know if many people know about this, but about two years ago, Brazil adopted a payment system. It's really driven by, you know, the central banks and the government over there called PIX. Uh, it's highlighted right there, PIX. Hmm. Uh, in less than two years, about 80% of the population is now using it broadly. It's kind of amazing how quickly the adoption has happened. Um, so Ricargo Pay is basically a payments platform, kind of like a super app, uh, similar to maybe WePay in China that does a lot of things or uh, like hmm. Grab in Singapore. Um, and the, I guess I want to say dirty little secret, but not so dirty <laughs> latin american companies are very reasonably priced um there's just not a lot of uh, not a lot of vc capital in latin america at least not on the scale that you see in the us or or even you know maybe in europe or india um and so valuations are quite reasonable um i think softbank had a big portfolio that was investing in latin america uh many years back it was about a five billion dollar portfolio uh for whatever reason i won't get into SoftBank, uh, changed their mind, <laughs> pulled pulled out of that. Um, and the guy who was running SoftBank's portfolio in Latin America, Marcel Clare, uh, raised a fund called Bicycle Capital that was $500 million um, and is still investing in Latin America. Um, so I think there's really great opportunities, not just this company. We've made three or four investments uh, down there. Brazil and Mexico in particular are really taking off, but the overall market for Spanish-speaking uh, Latin America and Brazil, uh, which speaks Portuguese, is tremendous. Amazing. I'll go super fast. I have a little bit of a theme today about websites uh, and people building uh, websites. So this first one is called Motive. Um, this company reached out to us. It was like one of these seemingly boring businesses. It was a website builder, um, but this was a website builder for uh, people who own dealers and dealerships. And it turns out you know, these dealerships need websites, they're incredibly complex to build. And a lot of commerce goes through them and the entire world is moving to buying online. Uh, And we invested in this company that helps these dealerships build uh, websites. And man, is it (laughs) doing really well. So there's Squarespace, we love Squarespace for general, and you know, building anything, but there are some websites that are super complex. 
long tail of websites, and we've found a number of companies that are working on that. Test Rigor went through Founder University and our accelerator. We made two bets on them, I believe. And it's a generative AI based test automation solution. People should be writing tests when they write code, they don't. And they're just taking that little narrow spot and trying to solve this problem. And then finally, Krepling is uh, building a drag and drop WYSIWYG style editor, uh, AI powered w editor for building um, modern e commerce websites. And so you can go into this, as you can see here, and build workflows uh, about registered users coming and then have them send an email, then offer a discount. So it's kind of pulling together offers and publishing and app building. Really amazing um, how this company has done. We made a small investment and then we watched them raise their prices. Uh, one of the great pieces of advice we generally have for companies is raise your prices. Um, same number of customers, triple your price, lose 10% of your customers, net net. <laughs> You're now at 270 let's say you were at $100 and you had 10 customers paying $10 each, you raise it to $30, you'll lose one. That's just fine. You're going to still do okay. And, and, and you'll, so, you'll lose your worst customer too. And you tend to lose the worst one. But I really like your uh, sustainable living uh, company here. We had an investment in a company um, that was doing modular housing and it was incredibly hard. And it seems like almost everybody who's gone up this hill has failed. But I do think somebody will figure it out and it's going to be a great investment. So I, I really would love to meet them at some point. Well done. I'll, uh, I'll connect you. They're, they've got a yeah. pipeline of business in Germany that's huge and we're trying to bring them to the US. Really, really hard uh, business. But um, And developers are really hard customers. That's one of the things we learned is that developers, selling into developers is really hard because they want to pay the lowest price possible. And then have the highest mark and sell at the highest margin. So their incentive um, is, you know, super, you know, to deliver the cheapest product and have the highest margin. What's the price per door? What they don't realize is like running of an apartment is the most, the cost of running the apartment is equally important for the person who builds or owns the thing. So your HVAC, your efficiency and energy, um, resistance to flooding and fire, which are the two biggest disasters in apartments and the biggest cost centers is floods and fires, even if they're contained. And so you should be incented to use better materials, better HVAC, better insulation. But there, <laughs> the construction people are like, oh, screw that. Just give us cheaper, 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 cheaper. <laughs> we want to buy this for $50 a square foot and sell it for 400 a square foot. You know, we want to open each door for the lowest price possible. It's like, well, the ongoing uh you know maintenance of these things also should come into play but good well, luck you, you hit yeah. on the part two of their business because they build digital building sensors into all those materials so once they yeah. deliver them there's actually a building operating system that the developers can run to measure all that as well which is super important yeah to know that this unit's got a flood or this one's on fire pretty important information that they generally don't have jordan real quick last three fun investments yeah oh, i'll go super go. quick uh, so the first two investments out of our recent fund, uh, the one we literally just launched like five minutes ago, uh, are Andres and Horowitz, who was a fund one investment that we made as well. You know, long relationship there, love what they do. I think they are absolutely fantastic and in that sort of upper echelon of, of top tier firms. Uh, I'll say founders fund kind of by default in the sense that we invested in their prior fund, which they ended up uh cutting in half given the the macro and i applaud them for it uh they're one of very few managers i know who has sort of taken money out of their own pocket in a sense uh to to become what they view as in line with, with the macro and so some of that initial exposure got pushed to their next fund which uh we are investors in out of our uh fund that we just launched as well uh so those are the first two and then the last investment we made out of our uh fund one which was last Fall, I want to say was seven seven six. Uh, so you know Alexis Ohanian's fund. A lot of respect for you know what he's built there, and uh, you know obviously that goes back to the the first thing we talked about as he was with uh, Gary at, at Initialized. Um, yeah, and so, he was the co-founder of Reddit. For the record, that's also yeah. You're right. I know. I, I was getting there. Too. Lest um, anybody so, forget yes, in their tweet uh, at, at a firm that he co-founded. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You know why well, it's so contentious, right? Because there's so little at stake. <laughs> it's just a tweet, folks. If people are starting oh, to spill tea and shade on, over a tweet. <laughs> I mean, how do they leave him out? 
<laughs> he becomes a co-founder. Ay, ay, ay. He is, uh, he is incredible. And, and going back to the comment I made earlier about like being humble and, and gracious, mm. um, I would put him, him in that camp for sure. Uh, he is just such mm. a, a really, really good human being. And so those are, those are our, our most recent three. Amazing. Oh, awesome. awesome. Uh, well, this has been an amazing episode, David. Thanks for hosting yeah. again. Well yeah. done. Am I going to see you at the uh, liquidity summit, you, David? You, are you, you going to make it? You, you okay, will great. see me. Awesome. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm excited about it. I saw some of the guests coming there. Pr pretty impressive. So I'm excited. Pretty about. impressive. When I need more LPs that to come. It's going to be June 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. But the main days are 2nd and 3rd. I'm sorry. The 3rd and 4th are like the content and activities days. The 2nd is just a welcome dinner and poker. And then the Wednesday is going to be uh, like a closing brunch. But I'm kind of making it, it used to be called Angel Summit. Now I just called it liquidity because it stopped being about angels. It started being about the LPs and the GPs. And we had, I just emailed all the GPs in our world. And I think 70 of them signed up. And okay. so now I'm in the process of inviting the Some LPs. LPs. What, and so what do you want? You, be, want it? you want foundations? Uh, you want endowments? I Let me think know. a couple of each would be great. And then I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do with this event. I want to do it twice a year. I want it to be super constructive. So one day of full content, poker every night, second day, some content, and then uh, set the afternoon events. But I'm wondering if I should do what iConnections does and have speed dating. But I kind of find speed dating. I don't know. I, I, I don't. How do you feel about it, Jordan? If I was like, hey, here's five fund managers. Do you want to sit with them or would you rather just meet them I, casually? I have always found that at those types of events, when you try and do speed dating, you suffer from massive adverse selection. From my perspective, I'd so much rather just mm -hmm. identify who it is ahead of time and try and find a way to connect with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I did so like eye connections. I went to eye connections twice and it was nice to set up meetings. Double they weren't all, they were double opt in. What did you say, uh, Dave? I think you should facilitate that process before they go and then have have the meetings that everybody opted into, double opted into there. But like I, usually what I would say is the speed dating is a mismatch for like 80% of the dates. Mm. <laughs> but there's no reason why you couldn't figure that out ahead of time, in my opinion. You yeah, don't so maybe have, have the like, GPs have tables and let the, G, the LPs come to meet them if they want to one morning. Yeah, I think if you've got like the GPs to give you like a one pager on their fund, maybe a 30, mm. 60 second video if they want, or or a short deck. Oh, that's a good way to do it. Send it ahead of time. Oh, yeah. yeah let and me here's let a presentation on my fund and a deal memo. And then you could, if you want to meet, you meet. That's a good way to do right. it. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, there's a lot of GPs. If, if I was an LP, if I got, you know, a list of, of the like one pagers on all these firms, I think I would. Start mm. by prioritizing the ones that I'm familiar with, right? And say, okay, this is actually someone I've wanted to talk to or someone I haven't talked to in a while or whatever. And I'd go through the rest and say, hmm, this is actually really interesting or really compelling or whatever. Mm. And I, I love that idea, actually. That would be, from my perspective, right. fantastic. What do you think of the video? You like the idea of a video or you just want to do a memo? I think videos you are watch always video? helpful. I would watch oh, okay. it after I, if I liked the memo. Uh, I would not watch Got it unless Perfect. I liked the memo. All right, Dave. Do I get to come now? <laughs> sure. I mean, you're here, so of course. Uh, where where is it happening? Uh, I do it in Napa. Um, this okay. is the sixth year I've done it. Maybe the seventh. I just did it because my book Angel came out, and a lot of oh, angel this, investors yeah, were like, "Hey, I want to hang out." And so right. we would just do this angel summit. And it was originally I thought maybe we get fifty people together, and then it's always been 125, which is the maximum most restaurants in Napa will take. Uh, so I've tried to keep it to 125. I got 70 GPs already. So I'm going to cut off GPs coming. And then I'm just going to have the other 50 slots be for LPs and founders can't come to it. And then service providers, we let them come if they buy dinner. So if they do a 25 or 50k sponsorship, we give them one or two tickets, and they just pay for the dinner, whatever. And so it defers a little bit of our cost. Um, if they want to do that. So typically banks or law firms or accounting right. firms or whatever will, you know, They'll want to buy lunch for everybody. And so it's quite nice. Um, but I'm trying to figure out a way to do cool. it that doesn't become overbearing. Because I don't want it to become like a bazaar and haggling and hard selling. So I like the idea of like more activities. Hey, we go on a wine tasting. We go to cooking class. You meet some people. You meet some people at poker. 
you know, or some board games will be set up. So you kind of more casually meet people is my goal. You, you, you know, what's interesting. Mark Schuster did this for a while and it became so successfully stopped doing it. He would publish the list of all the LPs and GPs that are going and people self, self aggregate. Um, that uh, could be another potential solution. Yeah. That's a, I will say I have found the, the less you can make it like a conference, the better in my perspective. Yeah. I think the more you can just have people organically converse and get to know one another. Um, I, I think it's far more more valuable. All right. Got it. All right, Jordan. You're in. Uh you're a fund of fun, so you should come anyway. Yeah. It'd be great to have you. We're gonna do a fund of fun panel. So you should be on that panel. Like Perfect. not panels. We're gonna have three fund of funds, give like a five to ten minute, like, hey, here's how we think about the world, and then have a round table discussion with the audience. So I'm trying to have it be just five minutes, ten minutes of like, here's what I think is happening in the world. Mm-hmm. So it's like low pressure presentation. Like it could be one chart. Here's what we believe. And then the next person, here's what I believe. Next person, here's what I believe right now. And then group discussion and then audience microphones passing. It really worked out really well in the last time. All right. Close this up, David. We we went long. Well, it's been another great episode of the Liquidity Podcast. Uh, For Dave McClure, Jordan Stein, Jason Calacanis, this is your host, David Weisberg. Thanks for listening. 